professor here at Edgehill uh, University, um, who's going to be talking about using technology, technology globally in evidence-based pedagogic research in living educational theories. I'm, uh, this was a, a session, I'm glad that I'm chairing because I was going to attend this one anyway because it sounds fascinating. So, uh, thank you very much, Jack. Okay, pleasure. Yeah, it's good to see everybody. But, uh, I'm just curious because what I'm going to try and cover in the 45 minutes is something that uh, I hope you'll be interested in. And it's something that I've talked over with Tim and others, that I've been coming here now as a visiting professor for, for many years. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you some of the global influences uh, that have come out of workshops and lectures, you know, that I've given in different countries around the world, and you see that what we call these little posters, they come out of everywhere, but there's nothing from Ed Hill. Okay? Now, I'm just curious about that because of the talent and the skill and the values every year that I see in terms of what Ed Hill is doing. And that is what I'm curious about is whether or not. Uh, and I know I've talked with Tim about the possibility that we can actually help to support the kind of inquiries of people associated with Edge Hill so that we can use the kind of technology that we will show you because you're all superb access to it. You know, today I don't need a laptop. You know, it's the first year where I can come, you've got the technology. It's actually fantastic what we can actually show. We previous session here it was all about ebooks about the publishing and how much more expensive it is to provide the students with stuff from libraries, whereas the staff here in terms of teaching and learning could be producing open access, really good quality research that was made available publicly for the students as well as other colleagues around the world. So that, you know, that's what I'm just hoping to stimulate today. And you can get this on the web from my web page, it's on actionresearch.net in the What's New section, you can actually look at the kind of detail and access to the various uses of the technology, whether it's terms of building posters, whether it's to do with the whole journal, the e-journal, educational journal of living theories, that you can get access to every issue from 2008, that is all open access, so you can access it from here. But I'm just curious in terms of your own interests. Now, I've talked to Tim again, so that sense of why you're here, you know, what is it that you might like to get from the session? Because I know what my interest is, is when we come back next year all being well, can I actually demonstrate that staff in terms of teaching and learning, you know, have actually got the research that we can make available globally using our technology? And that all the groups we're working with in South Africa, in Asia, in India, in Japan, they've got access to the work at Edge Hill University, especially in teaching and learning. But I just ask, because it's taken me years to actually understand what solstice stands for. Now, if I ask each person here, what does solstice stand for? You see, the shaking of the head, okay? Now, it started 2005 with Mark, you know, getting quite a big grant. And this is what it stands for. It stands for Supplied Online Learning for Students Using Information and Communications Technologies in Their Education. All right, so that's solstice. I'll get that with that later. I'll put it at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it at the bottom of this talk today so you can access it. And I've also put the YouTube from yesterday's workshop. Because we have people from Hong Kong, uh, we have people from different um, places like Kenya, we have Canada, you know, that, that came in through the Zoom. And we're actually talking in terms of people that we have face to face. And we're making those connections which we've now got recorded. Because people in the room came up to the camera and they were talking with the people on Zoom. So we got them all together. Now that kind of dialogue, is what I'm very interested in promoting on a global basis, but using the technology to spread what I call the embodied knowledge of professionals like yourselves, you know, throughout the world through educational research. So can I just check, you know, that sense of, uh, what are you interested in? You know, why are you here? You don't have to answer, but it's just, have you got any interest at all that I might be able to respond to and actually just support? So in 12 months' time, 
actually feel that, you know, we've made some advances in actually getting what is happening at Edge Hill, in particular teaching and learning, and I just want to mention why I think something is actually missing, and that is the educational, you know, from the teaching and learning, from the centre of teaching and learning. And what we heard the Vice Chancellor say, which I was really impressed. I've no idea it being here 30 years from next Wednesday. You know, and, they, and yet his passion and his values were coming over. It could be next year. You know, we could celebrate his 30 years and what he's been able to do here in terms of, you know, promoting uh, teaching and learning. You know, it's those kind of things that I'd like very much to feel that I'm supporting. But would you just like to go back to just say just a few words about you know, what is it or why you're here or is there anything that we might have that could interest you? Would you like to? I think I think that tried to be in the title has been global. Yeah, I like that idea that yeah. because I think it's really easy, particularly in Edge Hill, to, to work in silos. <laughs> well, particularly in this faculty, sorry, because yeah. this faculty. It's split into three different schools and it's really well, it's just getting wrapped up. I'd love to develop with you, for example, what moved me was uh, Gregory Bateson steps was an ecology of mind. And he moved me literally from what I was doing at the University of Bath, you know, within Mike Edge Hill, into a global perspective. And we were encouraged at the university. We went all over the world, funded to conferences because they were determined to spread internationally and globally. The research we were doing. So I'll very much focus on that. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody got any? I will. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a learning technologist, so I'm interested in how we as, as learning technologists could help the academics who are doing the research to, to share that and again the, global, the idea of the global thing. And actually, interestingly, on your point at the beginning about the open access, I, I've heard very um, unofficially that quite often research comes with grants that are on the basis that the research that you produce goes through a recognized publication that has those licenses attached to it and so if you've got any perspective on that I'd be really interested in hearing. Yeah, very much so. Uh, so that idea of the learning technology, you know, I'll be stressing the importance of maybe working with you over the next 12 months to say well look what educational influence have you had as a learning technologist to actually promoting learning technology with members of staff who will be using the technology then to enhance the learning with their students? Yeah, so definitely focusing on that, that would be great. And again, it would be great if you could possibly let if uh, Marie just sends around a piece of paper where you can just put your email, you know, so we can actually make sure that we just sustain some communication. Yeah, anything? I was going to say, I'm, my main role is I kind of engagement manager, so I pass on messages between the faculty and learning services and how to use their resources and pass on their resources as it were. So it's my job in a way to listen to things like this and pass on my knowledge to them and pass on the connections via <laughs> LTD etc. to make things happen as it were. Right. So I like to have an overriding knowledge of, of this. So that when I'm in a room with the academics and they're having those conversations, I can put in right. the right information at the right time. And I work with people who are just in this room before about you know the e resources, and that there's a lot of that information that isn't known or understood. Yeah. And so, yeah. It, it's actually it's linked to what you were saying because I've got here the last thing in that address which you've got access, you know, I'll show you, and it's from an academic engagement manager within. Uh, Durban University of Technology in South Africa. She's called Nalini Chukaran. And her living poster, I think, is really superb, which actually connects the staff, you know, with that whole idea of academic engagement. And what it is that you could do to show your educational influence in communicating and bringing people into those dialogues. You know, this is what's crucial about your own research into your practice. As a professional, no matter what you're doing in a university, I think you've got a higher education intent. You know, you want very much to influence somebody's higher education. And it could be through the lecturers, it could be your individual practice. Okay. Um, I, I've moved from learning technology, before it's called learning technology, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we first got to we were support officers, yeah. and then we became, became moved mm -hmm. off, but now I'm in research. 
and it, it's, I've seen things from a very different perspective. It's been very, it's been very exciting for me to move to move over. It's also, sort of, you dabble a bit and you, you put your bit in and you go to conferences and you say this, but you don't, you feel always like there's a little bit of that imposter syndrome going on. So now that I've moved into research, I'm working with a lot of people who have been working locally, and it's it's very interesting to try and lift yourself up and, and try and take a slightly different view. I mean, I can't be fascinated. I'm interested in the way that technology has put that, but it's making it possible now. It is, it is. And actually, what drove me from being a school teacher of science, which I was delighted, you know, I was really committed to that, to coming into a university as a researcher to try to shift the nature of educational theory, was when I recognised that what academics were doing in terms of educational theory, explicitly denying the value of my principles, my practical principles as a teacher, and to explain my practice. And then for the technology, the first professor appointed me, this was in 1973, he was one of the only professors of educational technology. You know, and I've always loved that notion of the technology and what we can actually do in research, but focusing on what is educational. And I want to stress how important that is to bring into our teaching and learning. You know, because it's so easy. History is full of examples of people learning how to do inhumane things. You know, you know how to learn. You know how to learn is going on at the moment. You know, you just got to look around the world and people are learning in different contexts how to do inhumane things. So I want to bring educational values to the fore of what we're doing, and then to encourage us to research. So, do you want to just say anything at all about me? Are you okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm a PhD student and research assistant here, and for me, it's, it's like I, I was really drawn to the living part of education, too, in which sense. So yeah, great. <laughs> no, that is what moved me um, into the University of Bath. This was 1973. Uh, the, pre the dominant view of educational theory uh, was that it was not living, but it was made up of the conceptual frameworks, methods of validation of philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history. And it's not that I'm denying the value of those insights, but it was the view that that was educational theory. And it was a Soviet uh, logician. It was called Ilyenko, and he published this text in 1977 on dialectical logic. And he asked the question, if an object exists as a living contradiction, what must the thought be that expresses it? Okay, so this idea of contradiction and being a living contradiction. Now, if you're actually um, in Western academic traditions, people like Karl Popper last century, he was actually determined to eliminate <coughs> dialectical thinking on the grounds that you couldn't have contradictions in correct thought. You've got to eliminate from theory contradiction. And on the surface of it, it sounds common sense. You know, you can't have two mutually exclusive statements that are true simultaneously. All right, that's the law of contradiction. It goes back two and a half thousand years to the work of Aristotle. Now, I believe that each one of you will recognize that you actually exist as living contradictions in the sense that no matter what you're doing, there will be some values of yours that are not being lived as fully as you believe they could be within the context of their children. This has been all of my working life I've been faced with those contradictions. So we need a form of living processes that bring that sense of contradiction within what we're doing with our questions, how do I improve my practice? And the I is a living contradiction. And it's not a negative thing, that. I have to, it stimulates my imagination every time that I see myself in the video here. You know, the, the video has been so important the inspector gave me one of the first ones in London. I was a head of science in a school to experiment with. First, they interned on myself. I believed I'd got inquiry and learning like in my classroom. Oh, it's really embarrassing, you know, to see myself and to see I was giving my kids the questions. Very subtly, but I was doing it. You know, that living contradiction immediately stimulated my imagination to see what can I do to live my values more fully. And everybody that I've worked with has had a similar experience. So when they recognize themselves, as a living contradiction, they actually start to imagine ways of improving it. And this is where the research is really vital, because unless we research it and make it public, 
you know, we don't actually share and extend the flow of those values of human flourishing. Am, am I making, again, am I making sense there? Because, you know, all of the academics that I, I, I meet, for example, not only here at Edge Hill, but around the world, they've been very, very influenced by uh, these centers, again, for teaching and learning. And every time I will, I ask the question about, well, what is it that is educational about the learning that is taking place? Because not all learning is educational. And I think you've got to be prepared, like in the technology we're talking about, like in the academic engagement, can you demonstrate that you're having an educational influence in anybody's learning, and this is the crucial thing, with values of human flourishing? Okay, the Peters and Hurst, who were my tutors and lecturers when I started my professional development in 1968 to 72, they stress the values laden nature of education. Even though their educational theory was mistaken, you know, by constituted by philosophy, psychology, social history, they were correct in actually locating education. What is education within the values laden nature of what we were doing? And it's the same with yourselves. But I'm saying that each one of you has got, for you to be here, <laughs> you were late towards the last of the sessions. It's showing a commitment in terms of the values and also it's energy flowing. You know, the values are always associated with what is energy flowing? Life affirming, energy flowing values that I'm suggesting that you look at in terms of your research, that you look at what it is that you're living within a chill that is contributing to the educational influences of your own learning and the learning of others and the learning of the social formations in which you're actually working. And that's what is the living of living educational theory. It's actually each one of us recognizing we have the capability of generating valid evidence-based explanations of our educational interests. So you look at your technology and your learning technology and you put the educational there so you start to work with colleagues to see, well, can I help you to actually develop your use of the technology and the learning of your students, which is educational. So it's to encourage you, like the academic engagement, can you integrate that, the education? What is educational about what each one of you is doing? And what kind of data do you need to collect to actually make a judgment about your influence? Okay, so again, I'll just pause. Is there anything else that comes to your minds about the kind of things that you know maybe of interest to you or what I might cover. Because I'm very aware that I can just talk at you. It, it encourages a kind of passivity, which is actually against the kind of educational principles I imagine that you're all supporting. Yeah. How, how would that align with PSLV requirements? So the program that I teach you is, is mapped against a uh, national standard. So there's a professional regulatory body that we, if you want to measure success in the case, it would be how many students are able to register yeah. with that body at the end of the programme. Yeah, you, if you follow a living educational theory research approach to professional development, it requires you to uh, acknowledge two understandings of being a professional and actually conforming to those standards of being a member of a profession. And the two things are different. That I am a member of the profession in the sense that I went through an initial teacher program, I conformed to the standards there, and you're actually then, and I became a teacher, you know, it was 1968. Now, that's very different, you know, conforming to those standards, which are essential uh, for belonging to a profession. But that is quite different about a sense of professionalism where I'm encouraging each one of us to research our own professional practice to show how we're trying to improve our educational influence in our own learning and the learning of students, again with values of human flourishing. Now, there is no professional body that, if you like, has got that requirement in it. You know, that we all want to be, I think, members of a profession. I'm a member of a profession, you know, I also 
the president of the British Education Research Association, when I was president, you actually felt part of uh, the profession of educational researchers. But that was different for actually my own sense of professionalism, which I'm encouraging you in higher education to see that you have a responsibility for researching your own professional practice with those values of human flourishing. And also, because you're fascinated with research, to make that knowledge public and to share it in a way that opens it to criticism and validation, which is where I think Edge Hill could enhance its reputation for knowledge creation, if you would all do that. <laughs> I don't know if you, whether it's I'd love just to connect, if you like. Is that feeling captivating your imagination? So, I think one thing I know with the academics is a lot more focus now on it, on research. And Edge Hill is, that's what it's aim is, research. Being in library and learning services, I know that the library is constantly pushing, do more with research, do more with research. And our research team is getting bigger and bigger to support the academics and research. But I think the way Edge Hill is at the moment is it will be employing more people to focus on research and it wants to increase those people in positions already that have that opportunity to do more as well. But it's getting that fine balance at the minute of giving people that opportunity to fill their passions, to have that opportunity to have the extra time. And I think that's where Edge Hill is at the minute. In my opinion, I could be completely wrong. But um, it's... it's got to find the balance of teaching and research in the academics rather than just giving them a job to do this and if you've got time do some research as well which is what some people have at the minute yeah, yeah. And is yeah. The cup, sorry is the cup lock, cup's lock on oh that's why it's not working yeah. <laughs> okay yeah, that's why it's not my you. Uh, it's <laughs> through experience um, <laughs> as soon as this comes on I'll get back in I'll show you at the end of the paper uh, the one from um, Dublin University of Technology and that, you know, academic engagement, which you're interested in. And the key question, if you like, I do hope you ask, and maybe I'm already asking yourself, but do you have any evidence that anything you've done has enhanced anybody's academic engagement? You know, you know it's those kind of questions. I used to ask senior uh, American researchers that question. You know, there were key people, Shulman of Dublin, really didn't like the question, you know, because they were, it was almost like pontificating, you know, and I asked the question. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, do you have any evidence that anything you've done has influenced the education of anybody? Sonia Halton was doing a book last once, which had a major influence on you know, that generation of teachers. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can fairly give a view from my point of view. And that I know that I've been in some meetings, said certain things, and just my voice being, but that's my role, that's what, if I don't do that, I've not achieved my role. Right, <laughs> and it's the researching of that role, I'm going to make sense here, that that's your role, you know, like academic engagement, but for you now, you may have already done this, it's to actually make public the research which explains your educational influence in seeking to enhance the academic... So that's turning me into the research. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's exactly that. But I'm saying that each one of us has got responsibility in higher education for our own professional development. Agreed. <coughs> and what I was saying before is, I mean, I agree I could do that, and every single member of staff knows we could do that, and every single member of staff has got an opportunity to do that, but they, they can't, because at the minute, many people have got that as a separate part of their job. And I don't know whether you all agree with me, I'm not in the room here, but there's a lot of academics that want to do a lot of research. I would happily write a paper, but I've got no idea how to do it. And technically, it's not part of my role, but it could be. But, um, it could, that's what we've got yeah. set up. Yeah. I'm not at Edge Hill except, but I belong in a research centre that's been set up for exactly that sort of thing. So I, I come from this, the, 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 this, this this area of, of professional services yeah. where I'm thinking, yeah. I'm writing this, I'm going to conferences and nobody's bothered. So we, we sort of support research with, we call it research with small R. Yeah. So it's not necessarily about yeah. getting this fantastic, you know, paper in this huge, renowned journal. I mean, that, that hopefully people will move on to that. Yeah. But it's about getting out there. It and, is, and, and that, that impacts things. So I we support agree, yeah. people like yourself who 
and, and we, we are coming up against some of the politics of the university and, and funding bodies and things like this and, and, and we, how much money we're bringing in. Imagine we're bringing in quite a lot because it's quite a lot of small pots all over the place. But it is getting that, it's capturing that, it is quite hard and it's been quite a battle to get it into in, place. In all honesty, I could turn it back round on myself because it could also be my responsibility yes. to help academics do this. Yes, so that's, that's kind of why I'm sat here. Because so that's what I want to do. It's hard yeah. without the university sort of it's written yeah. the, 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 yeah. it's the structure it, it sometimes is it can be very difficult well the passions there are definitely the same yeah I was just <laughs> got two no. people in the room and we've written an awful lot yeah. <laughs> great no, no just thank you this goes back uh, first of all in like, it was in 76 next one in 87 uh, I've got these letters you know from the university my university who said um, basically you can't teach this was from senate you can't do research and you've disturbed the good order and the rabbit, the whole school of education, right? Now that came from Senate. Now a professor of public law just took on my case and they had to give me a tenured appointment until 2009, right, okay? So I've enjoyed an enormous freedom. But in 1987, I've got this lovely one from the Secretary of Registrar of the University which says, your activities and writings are a challenge to the present and proper organization of the university and not consistent with the duties the university wish you to pursue, right? And it was because I had actually published a self-study of my engagement with various committees on the university, which were actually hostile to what I was doing. Now, I don't think any of you would need to go through that kind of tension, but it's like now what you're saying about the university not actually perhaps providing the kind of opportunities which you need to fulfill your responsibilities, to research, if you like, your own practice as part of your life as a professional. But I do think that you'll be doing this, I believe, anyway. You know, you'll want to try to improve your practice. And as part of that, you want to gather data from what you're doing, and it could be with your colleagues, especially about that use of the technology and the academic engagement. You'll want to actually gather some data so you can make an evidence-based judgment about your influence. And that will mean looking at the nature of your influence, especially in their use of technology, can that be traced then to the student learning? Now I believe you're actually intuitively working on those kind of questions anyway, and what I'm just encouraging is the making experts of that. And maybe like Tim, just, just maybe forming <coughs> a group of interested colleagues who so actually occasionally will be coming together just to share the actual results of those kind of inquiries. You know, it doesn't take a lot of time, this, because you're doing it professionally. But the questions that you can be enabled to ask, you know, it's like this. Uh, this is what's called a living poster. It comes from um, Alini <coughs> Chitterand, and she is an academic development practitioner scholar at uh, Dublin University of Technology. And if you go into this, and it's towards the end of, you know, the paper that I got on the web for you, it's in the What's New section of actualresearch.net, you'll be able to see if this is the kind of thing that you could actually just produce yourself. Again, Maria, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that, but certainly in terms of accessing how to produce your own living poster. So next year, I can be back here actually being able to show the living posters from Edge Hill University, possibly for the solstice, and the CLT, yet centre that have been supporting this work, whereas at the moment I can't. Do you see what I'm getting at? That you, you, I believe that work about the technology and the learning, but with the educational influence, your educational influence, bringing your values and the confidence to research or practice, <coughs> could have in the knowledge creation for our children. But, sorry, go. If you just move back and put Nalini's work in the context of the Northwest Uni North no, Durban University of Technology, you can see perhaps more what it is that Jack's saying, that you might actually want to work together to support one another, developing your professionalism, which is also to share your knowledge, not just as research with a little r, but this is research with a big r. This is actually testing the validity of your claims having an educational influence in the learning of others and contributing to the learning of Edge Hill 
university as well as your department faculties. And what we've um, got here, you can go in living posters, there's, it's not an academic poster. It's not anything, this is the right one and this is the wrong one. This is the prettiest, this is, it's not that. It's whether or not it just communicates from your position at the moment, a snapshot so people know what it is that you're doing, your context, what you're passionate about in your professional practice to want to be improving. We've got a number, you can see there, we've got uh, some from the um, Mongolian research community, there's some from the Indian research community, Nelson Mandela across the top, the different universities, Nelson Mandela University, Northwest, Durban University, so if you click on that one, you can see that Nalini took the ideas of living educational theory and research as professional development. And the professionalism is both researching into your practice to see whether or not you're actually doing what you think you're doing, and if the educational influence that you think you're having, test that for yourself, and then to actually test that with others, to make that public. And she um, has developed a course, an induction course, that both um, established academics in the university as well as newcomers have engaged in. And this was uh, her la la the last programme that she ran. So if you go into each of these, you'll find their living poster. Go on to any of them, Jack. Yeah. Uh, actually, this, this, so that's the one. Hers looks very different. Each one reflects your own personality, and you can update it. We archive it, so you can use it as a way of use in your own uh, progression. And um, there's also a, a link, I can't see it at the moment, but there should be a link on the presentation, the eight minute presentation. All we've got is the slides that she will have used. Some people use their poster, some actually have uh, slides. So you can see with Nalini what she's actually done for creating this group that you guys might want to actually work together. Mm -hmm. So this time next year, you could share, make a presentation, this conference, to your colleagues to say, and this is what we've been doing over the last year, each of us and holding it together, improving our professionalism, our professional practice, and doing what you're saying, actually in making that, testing it with a greater, but also through the technology, then the people, for instance, in Durban University Technology, can learn from what you're doing, as that you can learn from what they've been doing, where they've got to. So it's actually valuing the knowledge that you're creating and making that accessible as a gift, an open gift, rather than this is what you're going to have, rather take from it and we hope that it will contribute to your uh, journey and hope that you'll offer a gift that we might be able to learn from. That's, I think, what um, uh, Jeff has been talking about. Tim, I think you were going yeah, to read I mean, on this. Yeah, the reason my name's been mentioned a couple of times is that I threw my hat in, in yesterday. I did come to these sessions last year and was inspired. It was waiting for somebody else to come forward. But mm -hmm. yesterday just seemed to be the right thing for me to come forward to, just to help set up a, an interest group that could turn into something like this. Um, so there's two of us now, plus Jenny, Jenny Daniel, who teaches uh, dance or musical theatre. Two of us, so anyone else that's interested, please, also, please get in touch. We need to know that Mark is also going to contribute to that group and is very oh, supportive of this as well. So he said he would. Good. Uh, so Linda's supportive as well. Um, so it looks like something's happening. Yeah. And then it shows your head though in terms of influence. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it is lovely. If you look at it, uh, this way, uh, look at this, the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. Now, look how that connects with the solstice, you know, the CLT, the Centre for Learning and Teaching. Um, and this is, is, it's a shame in a way that um, the woman who introduced me um, to Derby University of Technology, where I was able to have this kind of influence, with John Connolly, and unfortunately she died last week, and uh, I'll be doing the eulogy. You know, she was fantastic in terms of bringing the staff to this kind of inquiry process. And when you look at the numbers of people involved, you know, you see um, 
how you, you know, like with Tim, it starts gently, it just starts with you saying and recognising what each other is doing. I don't know who met this guy, he was called Peter, what was his surname? Uh, Ledbetter. Ledbetter. Now, Peter Ledbetter uh, gave a, a superb presentation yesterday. And again, I just hope with Tim that that connection with Peter Ledbetter, it was about the medics, wasn't it? About the use of psychology in the medical undergraduate programme. And the sensitivity that he showed and the values base. I was just thinking, look, I want to show this more widely because it's inspirational. And this is coming out of Edge Hill. But it just at the moment, I don't think you can sense my frustration, but I can't do it. You know, I can't go over to the South Africans and say, look, you know, this is actually happening at Edge Hill. You know, and that technology one is so vital. The academic people around the world are interested in that academic engagement. How do you encourage them? You know, the research. How do you actually get this research in the way? Yeah, Could no, you no. just click back again? Back again. Yeah. Saying about the global influence. And you don't realise what, what you can do. Uh, yes, there. You see those flags around the corner? Um, that represents... A jail was up here. You're part of that global community. And yes, people might not do lots of clicks and all the rest of it, but it might be the connection that you, somebody from Mongolia makes with you. Somebody we had this morning, uh, yesterday from Kenya makes with you. That you don't know where it is that it goes until you actually offer it. And sometimes you never find out. But how good would it be if you actually sort of just had a look around some of these and you find somebody on the other side of the world. And sometimes the person next door to you, in the office next door to you, is actually, oh, hang on, you're wanting to do the same, you're wanting to actually develop your professionalism in a way I'm doing both in mine, in your particular field of practice, you're wanting to develop in mine. But if you don't offer it, how do you make those connections? So it's the use of that technology. To, I suppose just sort of a sign in that way, we can do that work recently on phenomenal based learning that I did think about it earlier on. But one of the things that's been amazing is we found that not many people are doing it in HE. It's very it, it's obviously the Finnish curriculum and nothing else. And we, we we just reached out to people and we found people in Australia, in the US, in Spain, and we we, we just thought, let's send them an email. Yes. We send them an email and they've been fantastic. They've all come in and they've all helped us and done so we were amazed that they all reacted so positively. We thought we thought they might just ignore us. <laughs> it's been amazing. I'm just thinking it's might be a really nice place. Yes. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. Do, do you see what, what you might do with that group, say, the Finnish and the other people? Yeah. That you could just ask, you know, it's the third of your Just have a flip round, because these are people... Yeah. Oh, well, I've got education. Yeah. 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 And it's a challenge to the university yeah. as a higher education. What is it you're doing as a higher educational establishment, as well as fulfilling all the responsibilities for training and delivering on those at the same time. Yeah. So we want to urge Hill up there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Tim, you can help with that. It's just what you've described there. Do you see how it fits so well with this kind of uh, the community generated? And it's global, you know, that interest in it, what was actually stimulated. And I'll just mention this one, and I, at some point I would love you to just go into the uh, what's called near. And this is the network of Educational Action Central Ireland. And initially there were five women, and four of them got their living educational theory doctorates in 2006 and 7 from the University of London. Now when you go in and see what they've done and they've published uh, in terms of the last <coughs> excuse me, 15 years or so, it's remarkable. You know, and it just started with this kind of conversation. Um, they've actually done this. Did you want to? Yeah, could you just... Hold those in mind. Flip back to your site, Jack. Because the credibility of living educational theory research as an established academic methodology and paradigm is really important. So if you go back, again, if you go down to the living theory doctorates, and if you go down there, then you'll find those people from Neary who actually did that own living educational theory thesis 
which were validated by Limerick University. If you go through some of the others, you'll see that they've been validated by universities around the world. So it's not a case of, oh, this is just a little niche thing that is actually of no use whatsoever. If you just turn, we had somebody in Tasmania. We had, um, there's more than I can think of, but have a look. This one. If you want any confidence to go through there. Yeah. So, um, can, can, I say, can I just say what the appeal is for me? I think, mm -hmm. that first of all, it's personalised, and that's where the living comes in. It's authentic mm -hmm. to me. And second, it's self organising, but mm -hmm. in an informal way. So it's not another kind of bureaucratic committee or network. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think what I hope for is that there will be a kind of space for mutual support as well. But working across the university, yes. so we're not going to have that pressure of uh, the job description really, or any kind of management issues or anything like that. Uh, but I think work, working to support each other is probably the most important thing I'd like to get out of it yeah. on a day to day basis. The last thing I want is just another, another thing on my to do list. I'm chairing, but I, I, so I'm researching the space professionals at the moment. So people like myself and Stuart and, and Sonia, who you know, we're, we're not academics, uh, we're not administrative staff. We're in, in like, this middle space. Third space professionals. Those third space professionals, yeah. So um, I think this is a vehicle for. There's, there's not many stories. There's, there's lots of definitions of what it is. There's not many stories of what what, what they do and, and how they do. It. Which is what my research is is, is, is phenomenological, but it's 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 getting those stories, I think, of the work, you know, with the interns, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. the, the work which has dem massive demonstrable impact mm -hmm. on students' experience mm -hmm. and education. And so but could I just ask, yeah. could you also think of yourself genuinely as academics? Yes. Yes. I know what you mean in terms of a role with the Atlanta University, yeah. but the very fact that you're wanting to research in a scholarly way your own professional practice is producing academically validated research. Anyway, I'll get yes. let, let me finish there because many thanks for coming along. You know, for me this has been really interesting. So thanks very much indeed. That was really great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Oh by the way, can you just flip back and leave your site up there? Please mm -hmm. go on there. And um, if you put your emails on there, yeah. then um, I'll uh